All right, guys, it's 4.55. I'm going to get the talk started. So uh, welcome to the session for FISAL, aka uh, Containerizing Cloud Foundry, or Bosch releases. Um, my name is Aaron Lefkowitz. I am an engineering manager at, in the Helium Cloud Foundry group at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I've got a background in SaaS. I've only recently come into PaaS space, but I think it's really cool. I really like Go and network systems. I've got a collection of plushy gophers to prove it. Hello, everyone. I'm Vlad. I'm the technical lead for Cloud Foundry at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, I've been working on Cloud Foundry projects since about 2011. And uh, I'm a big fan of metal and uh, StarCraft. So <clears throat> I want to start with the question of why can't we just use Bosch? So this is the question that we've got to answer in order to proceed. Um, so Bosch is really about virtual machines, right? When you deploy with Bosch, you get virtual machines. But we wanted something for containers. Uh, it's kind of apparent to everyone in this room, a lot of workloads moving to container-based uh, sorts of deployment mechanisms, right? So we wanted a part of that cookie, but we also really like Cloud Foundry. So we needed something for both, right? And it's also for science, because you know we have, oops, timers. Um, we have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and we want to see if we can take it apart, take those two things into their distinct parts. So in order to separate all the things, uh, the first thing we had to realize is that you know, as we started on this journey is that Bosch and CF are a little bit more tightly coupled than we first had imagined. Um, you know, and Bosch technology choices also kind of limit the implementations that we could do for this. Um, for example, uh, if you look at the diagram, you can see on the left-hand side, we've got, you know, the Bosch agent stem cells, all the Bosch-related things. Those are squarely in the Bosch land. And on the right side, you've got jobs, configurations, packages, all in the Cloud Foundry land. But kind of in the middle, where these things come together, we've got Monit and these ERB templates. And these things are a lot harder to deal with. Um, in particular, uh, you know, if you look at Cloud Foundry, the components are composable. They've got well-defined boundaries and APIs. But kind of ironically, the lines are a little bit more blurry when you get into this middle section here. So for example, the ERB templates, they're, well, they're written in ERB. It means if you don't have a Ruby parser, you can't use them, right? So that kind of limits kind of the technology you're allowed to use around that. And they also contain, like the, the templates themselves also happen to contain, you know, entire Ruby classes and functions, which makes them really hard to emulate. Um, so we wish that those kind of things didn't get into them over time. So porting this to another system isn't really feasible. And the fact that Monit is there and it's sort of, that's the only thing you can use. Um, I wish I knew how to use PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> but it's the only service daemon that you can use. Uh, that's it. So basically, you can't, uh, it's sort of undesirable. We wish we could switch it over system D or whatever, but we're stuck with Monit. So uh, Vlad's going to get into a little bit more about what's kind of inside now. Okay, so given all that, uh, how are we doing this? How is FISL turning Bosch releases into containers? Um, so first we start from an Ubuntu trusty base and we put a stem cell layer on top of that. So hopefully you guys know what stem cells are. Uh, we create the stem cell layer much like Bosch does. So we run some scripts and install dependencies on top of trusty and we get that stem cell layer. On top of the stem cell layer, uh, we have packages and jobs. Packages are compiled, and you have jobs with their templates, their configurations, and so on. And then next to all this, we have some secret sauce, which is not that secret, really, because we're going to tell you what it is. Uh, it's Configin. It's a tool that will deal with uh, the Bosch templates and run its H, which is the entry point to every Docker image that uh, FISL creates. Um, these images don't have a Bosch agent, um, and you basically can use anything that knows Docker to deploy them, whether it's uh, Compose, Kubernetes, etc. Oh, next slide. Okay, so we just talked about the fact that we have compiled packages that are part of uh, our container images. So how do we do those? Well, we do it at build time. Contrary to how Bosch works, um, you, when you deploy the first time, it'll compile packages on, on the stem cells. We do it at 
build time when you build your, uh, your container images. Um, we have a compilation layer. So we were able to separate the dependencies that you need at runtime for the Docker images versus the ones that you just need to compile the packages. So again, you start from trusty, you have this compilation layer, which is basically dependencies for compiling things. And then using uh, Docker and Go, we parallelize everything and compile all of your packages using all the cores on your box. Um, this also does smart detection of dependencies. So for example, if I say I want um, NATs and um, the NATs forwarder on one image, it'll just pick out the packages that are needed for those jobs and it won't compile anything else. Also, if you use multiple Bosch releases um, and the same package is being used in, in more than one, we only compile that once. Okay, so now we know how the layers are created uh, for these images. We understand how the packages get compiled. What else do we need in order for FISL to do its job and, and give us Docker images for basically all of the Bosch releases? So we need, a, uh, we need Bosch releases that um, have been built, dev, dev Bosch releases, so not final Bosch releases. We need a role manifest and opinions. These are all required at build time. They're not required at deployment time. So using all this information, FISL will be able to output Docker images. And next we're going to see how these, uh, these two, configuration, um, two configuration inputs uh, look like. Okay, so on the left we have a role manifest. And again, I want to emphasize this is used at build time the user that deploys these, uh, these Docker images will never see this. Uh, you have a list of roles. So these, for each role you'll get a Docker image. And for each role you need to specify what you want in it. So in this example we have NATS, the NAT stream forwarder, and Metron agent. So at the end, if you feed this into FISL, you'll get a Docker image that contains um, these three jobs. And then we have a configuration section. So we wanted to do configuration through environment variables because we've noticed that it's a, it's a best practice and we've seen it in things like 12-factor apps. Uh, environment variables are really easy to use with Docker. So we created the, these templates that you see here in the left, on the left, to help map environment variables to uh, Bosch uh, job properties. On the right, we have opinions. Um, on the top, you see uh, it's basically a Bosch deployment manifest with just the properties section. And those are configuration defaults that will be baked into the images. Things that the user won't be able to change, they're basically your opinions of how the, the container should run. Then we have dark opinions, and this is something to make security guys happy. Uh, anything that's in there won't be allowed to have a default. So there we enumerate all the secrets in the system so that you could never you could never get uh, one of those secrets have a default baked into the image. Okay, so now we understand how FISL creates things, how the images look like, um, how packages get compiled, and the configuration we need to pass to FISL. Uh, how does it run? So when I do Docker run one of these things, what happens? Well, the entry point, which we call run sh, We'll execute some, some scripts that are very useful for hooking into the process. So if you have something that needs to change, you don't like something that um, this automated, automated process creates, you could hook into that point. It runs configing to process all the, all the Bosch templates. It'll then start rsyslog and cron, and finally start monit. Once monit starts, all the, process, all the jobs that monit uh, is monitoring will start up eventually. And then finally we trap int and term signals so that when Docker try to, tries to stop us, we can, we can shut down gracefully. Now I'm gonna pass it back to Aaron. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more, I mean we saw how to configure Fissile itself and how to tell it what images are you gonna build. But I wanna talk a little bit more about configuration of Cloud Foundry. 
because it's sort of a topic on its own and we wanted to dive into it just a little bit here and to see how we kind of tackled this problem. So, uh, you know, configuring Cloud Foundry is hard. There's a lot of values to configure. And we wanted to kind of distill this into something simpler for this user. So we kind of created Configin uh, that augments Bosch template. It does the same thing, but it can pull from multiple sources, such as environment variables, which we talked about prior to this. Um, and then we also employ those mustache templates you saw a few slides ago to kind of help eliminate complexity and redundancy in configuration of Cloud Foundry. So just to give you an idea, you know, there's a lot of configuration values in Cloud Foundry. We have specs. Uh, these come from the job spec files. And there's 500 some values of that in CF release and Diego release alone. Um, and then we get to the level that we call opinions, where we can safely define defaults. And we have about 200 of these, where you actually don't need to really ever set these for most deployments. So uh, there's 200 of those, followed by what we call user global. And this is values that users actually care about. They actually want to change. And there's about 90 of these. These are host names, IP addresses, ports sometimes. Secrets. Uh, and secrets, especially secrets. Um, and then we have user role. So user global is sort of for the entire system, where user role uh, is for a specific VM. So for example, the API and the cloud controller and its jobs. Um, that could have a specific value for nats.machines, for an example. And there's about 20 of these that we want. And so we had two schemes. And I'll go quickly through one that we didn't really work for us and one that did. So the first one we tried was something I'm calling layered dynamic. And this is something that we kept in the four key spaces. We kept values for everything. So we had spec, opinions, job, and role. But there was a few problems with this. We used console to do it. So there was each of those values was in there. But every time we looked it up, uh, you know, we had to do the fallback. Is it this one? Is it this one? Does this exist? And so it was actually quite slow to run. And we didn't actually gain anything from it because we still had to restart the container. So despite having this dynamic ability to configure it, nothing really changed. And we also had to have yet another KV raft process in the cluster. As you know, Cloud Foundry CF Release already has a console instance. Diego and Loggergator all already have etcds. So we were putting another one of these kind of hard to configure for HA type processes into the mix. And we just didn't need that. So we kind of toned it down and went with something simpler, which I'm terming layered static here, where we have uh, everything is pre-computed inside the container based on the role manifest and the templates we've already seen. And everything else is provided through the environment very easily uh, for user values. So uh, this worked out really well for us. Um, in addition to this, uh, these are just a list, a sampling of the pull requests that we've done in our team to basically change a lot of things like DNS lookup and hard-coded values that are kind of subtly related to Bosch in certain ways, as well as you know, uh, systems that touch proc with uh, kind of impunity. And so we're, this is kind of an ongoing effort to, like I said, separate that peanut butter and jelly sandwich just a little bit more. Um, so yeah, the next thing that I want to go into is a demo. So I'm going to show you a demo of Fissile in action. So I'm going to switch over to this. And yeah, let's see. I need to end this. This and this is going to be. I need to mirror one moment. Hopefully, we can see this. Yes. Hopefully, the font is also not big enough. Let's do better with that. Are we good there? Can we read it? Okay, excellent. I'm going to do the same over here just so we get a clear vision of what's going on. So I put together this folder. I've got a couple things going on here. I have a CF release. And inside CF release is just a pre-compiled uh, Bosch release. So Bosch create release dash dash force. Um, I have a fissile RC, which is going to basically uh, pass command line arguments into fissile. So there's a bunch of stuff here. 
Um, I have a config in which is required because we bundle this into the image that we're about to create. And then I have this config directory in here that has all the files that we were just talking about. So we can see uh, these are my opinions. These are the things that are not likely to change and will be baked into the image, such as the port for NATs or the fact that trace is turned to false. Um, the next thing I have is my dark opinions, which we also saw. And these are the things that I don't want defaults for, even if I've specified them here, I'm, I'm not gonna actually be able to use them. So this value will not go through. Um, and the last thing we have is the role manifest. And so we saw an example of this. You can see here that I've defined a container or a role called NATS. It has one job, it has NATS from the CF release. And so I've also commented out a couple processes here that I'm not going to need for this demo, such as the NATS stream forward and Metron agent. We can kind of control the processes that go into each container by modifying the role manifest. And then lastly, you can see our configuration templates at the bottom, the mustache templates that we were talking about. So with that, I'm going to actually build the, um, the actual image, or sorry, the packages. So this is the compilation step, and of course I forgot to source my FISAL RC for all my things. So you can see that because I disabled NAT stream forward, or FISAL intelligently does not build Ruby, which it does not need, despite it being part of that kind of uh, job. So you can see it compiled Go and GNATS D. And the next thing I'm gonna do is actually build the image with this compiled package. So now you can actually see in my Docker images, which looks lovely, um, you can see a container with the ID uh, fissile-nats. So that's the container we just built. The fissile role base and the fissile co compilation base that you see there are ones that we discussed elsewhere and take a little bit longer to build. And those are the runtime and the compilation dependencies. So now I'm actually going to uh, start this container up. So we're gonna do one of these. And here I have, let's check. So this is actually a script that's just curling um, the endpoint. It's looking for monit actually. And so when I run NATS, you'll see that monit kind of pops up and we see on the right hand side does not exist right now, except the T is on the second line. But you can see that it knows that NATS is not ready yet. And now, NAT's process has actually started up. Monit is reporting that it's up. And this is just a regular CF Monit that's in every VM that you would produce with Bosch. And now we're ready to actually connect to NAT's just to prove that it's working, right? So I have a listen command here. Sometimes it's gonna take a little while to start. The process says it's up, but Ruby, right? There we go, so subscribing to NATS. Uh, it's just subscribing on the wildcard here, and then we're gonna send just a hello world um, to it. And you can see that it gets passed along to the server, and there you have it. We have uh, NATS running in a container just in plain Docker that you can use with anything. Kubernetes, you could use it with Docker Swarm. Uh, you know, the world's open as long as it's Docker, which is what Fisal produces, right? And now we're gonna see another portion, another piece of this demo. So I'm gonna pop that up here. Good to go? Yep. Okay, so this is a video uh, that we built for this. And uh, here we see uh, Cloud Foundry running on Kubernetes, basically. Uh, we took five Bosch releases, we took CF release, we took Diego release, Garden, MySQL, etcd. We turned them into Docker containers and we deployed them on Kubernetes. We went a bit further than that. So on, on the right, what you're seeing is kubectl get pods. Uh, and we went a bit further and we wanted to make it HA. So you'll see that you have actually more than one API role running, more than API, you have three API workers, you have multiple cells, multiple MySQLs, multiple nets, etc. Okay, so on the left, on the top, what you're seeing is a process that's making requests to an app that, that's deployed on the thing on, the, on Kubernetes. 
And right below that, we see a Chaos Monkey script. So what that does, and hopefully you see that this thing has sped up and it keeps going faster and faster, but the script there kills something every minute. So it takes something at random, one of the roles, like a cell, like an API, and just kills it. And at the bottom, we have the distribution of Diego. So that, that actually shows us how the app is, be, is being distributed among the Diego cells that's being requested by the process at the top. And we can see that we basically get this for free. So we, we built the Docker images, uh, we created some configuration for Kubernetes, and now uh, we have an HA deployment of Cloud Foundry running on it. And um, we ran this experiment for about 20 hours. Uh, about 900,000 requests were made. Um, and in total, there were about 1,200 killings of, of roles. And the thing stayed online. Uh, we're not done yet. Not all of the roles are fully HA. We still have some gaps. So, you know, it would be great if we could get some help to, to get to 100%. So now that the video is done, um, I would actually like to take you to the live thing. Can you switch me up to a terminal? Okay. So hopefully you see this. The fonts are a bit smaller. But this is the system that you, saw, you just saw earlier and it's still up and running. We don't run the Chaos Monkey anymore, but um, you can see kubectl get pods is still running on a watch there. The app is still making requests and we have uh, Veritas here at the bottom. So just to show you how one of these things look like, I'm gonna exit Veritas. I'm gonna exit this container that I'm in, which is a Diego debugger, and I'm gonna docker exec into one of the cells. So here we just see the command line there. It's docker exec, and then we get the ID of the first Diego cell. Uh, basically every uh, image that Fissile spits out will have a label with its role, so we can look it up easily. So we're just gonna go in there, and I'm gonna take you to a familiar place, probably. So you can see here we're in var vcap. Because of the tight coupling between the peanut butter and jelly that we talked about, earlier, there are still some things that we can't change, like uh, the templates still need a var vcap. The way we load packages and run them still need a var vcap. So when you go into one of these containers, you'll actually see the same, uh, the same structure. And uh, that's about it. This is the live system running. Get back to the presentation. Wow, that's the wrong view. No, you were good. I did it. Okay, <laughs> um, so the end, just wrapping up here, uh, we, oh, this is yeah. your part. <laughs> yeah, so um, we still have work to do. We wanna add support for other types of uh, base images. Uh, we want to improve layering. Like you saw, we just have the base, then we have stem cell, then packages and jobs. We could be much smarter there where we take advantage of layering in Docker to reduce the, the amount of downloading that we have to do. Uh, we also think that this logic monit is possible, so we would like to give that a try. And also we want to continue the effort to decouple Bosch from, from Cloud Foundry. So uh, with that, you know, as of now, um, you know, we're open sourced Fissile and Configin. Those repos are available at github.com slash hpcloud, fishlal, and configin. Um, so you can go check those out right away. Um, and so kind of what are we releasing with that? Uh, just the tooling. There is no images. We're not going to be providing CF images for anyone. Uh, that's up to you guys. But hopefully with uh, the docs and whatnot or any collaboration you want to do, we can get images out of it very easily. That is, of course, the tooling's entire job. So um, I do want to just kind of say thanks to you know, Hewlett Packard Enterprise for giving us the incentive and time to work on this, as well as our other uh, members of the HCF team who have contributed also to Fissile, um, as well as the Cloud Foundry community and especially the Bosch project for actually making this possible. Because without the contracts that 
are there that they have laid out, we wouldn't have been able to do this. So it's actually a kind of a testament to that. So yeah, uh, with that, kind of want to open it up to Q&A, and thank you very much.